Good morning. I'm Rachel Fleming May. I'm an associate professor in the School of Information Sciences at the University of Tennessee. And Teresa Walker, my colleague in the library is there, and I are going to be talking about three studies that we conducted as part of the Live Value project. So what was Live Value? This may be a, a name that's familiar to some of you. Um, it's the value, outcomes, and return on investment of academic libraries grant project. It was funded by IMLS. Um, Co-PIs were Carol Tenniper at the School of Information Sciences, Paula Kaufman, who was then dean of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign Libraries, and um, Martha Curilidou at ARL. So what did we do with Live Value? Um, we looked at the purpose of Live Value was to develop a, a suite of products, tools that libraries could use to demonstrate the value that they contribute to their larger institution. What Teresa and I are going to be talking about today are the studies that we did that looked at uh, the contributions of the library to teaching, success, student success, and learning. Uh, I'm going to talk specifically about a survey that we did of instructors and then a three-session instruction workshop series that we did as well. Teresa is going to talk about study of use of the commons. So, <clears throat> excuse me, when we're talking about library, the library in the life of faculty, we're talking about library in the life of users at this conference, typically we talk about the way that faculty use the library for research. We don't really look very frequently in, in the LIS research at how faculty use the library to support their teaching. So we saw that as kind of a gap in the research that we wanted to fill. We decided to do that by conducting a survey. We did it at University of Tennessee Knoxville first, and then we replicated it at University of North Carolina in Wilmington. If any of you are interested in conducting this at your institution, please let me know. We're happy to work with you to um, conduct it wherever you are. So at both institutions, we conducted the survey with anyone with instructional responsibility. So that included tenure line faculty as well as teaching instructors um, who are contingent and GTAs, also administrators that might have some teaching responsibilities as well. So we asked them about you know, both how they use the library to find materials for their students to use. I know as an instructor, I very infrequently assign a textbook in my classes. All the readings that I assign come from databases that we subscribe to through the libraries. Um, and then also reading that they also do or work they also do through the libraries to support their own pedagogical development. So it was very interesting to conduct this survey at two different institutions that are so different. University of Tennessee is a very large land grant public research institution. University of North Carolina Wilmington, also a public institution, but regional, much smaller. Um, we had good responses from colleges all over both universities, and I'm not going to go into details here. Uh, some of these slides I've included, just so you all can go back and look at them later if you're interested. So overall, we found that instructors um, do use the library. They do ask their students, and this is at both institutions. Teal represents University of North Carolina Wilmington, and of course, Power Orange represents University of Tennessee Knoxville. Um, I, I came to, to Knoxville from University of Alabama, which is, of course, crimson, and it was kind of an adjustment to me to, to move to this. Safety orange is what it looks like to me. Um, so they do ask their students to use the library for their work, but less frequently do they ask librarians to work with them on materials for their courses. Um, unsurprisingly, probably, at University of North Carolina, which is a stronger teaching focus than research focus as at University of Tennessee, there was more usage of the library to support their own teaching. So both at both schools, though, people had a good impression of the library and, and found it very helpful in terms of their teaching. They said that they saved time, they saved money, which is you know, important, especially if you're a GTA or a contingent um, instructor. They saw improvements in their own teaching the materials that they were able to use in their courses, and then also in their student performance as a result of using, asking their students to use the library. 70% of both schools, roughly, said that their readings were more up-to-date as a result of using the library and what the library made available to them, and then also that they could expose their students to better resources. They also saw improvements in the kinds of sources that their students were citing. 
and that they were pulling information from a wider variety of resources. So one of the great things about conducting a study like this is that it's a wonderful opportunity for public relations. Just by doing a survey and asking people if they use certain services or collections, you're informing them about those services and collections if they didn't know about them pre previously. So that was one of the great things. We saw over and over again, especially at University of Tennessee, comments from instructors who said, you know, I, I wasn't even aware that you all offered this. Um, they love access to electronic journals. It, it was a little surprising to me that part of the, the emphasis on savings of their, own, of their own money had to do with making photocopies and making things available electronically. They didn't have to spend the money to make photocopies anymore, which sounds a little bit trivial, but really, again, if you're, if you're working on a stipend of $1,000 a month as a GTA, that makes a big difference. So people did say, you know, I'm embarrassed that I haven't used the library more. Just by learning about these things, I plan to make this a requirement for my students. Um, this last quote I really enjoy because this person I felt really got it. They said, I feel more confident and see improvements in student performance when I use the library as a resource and refer students to the educators that work there. Um, again, in terms of public relations, one of the questions that we did ask was, you know, would you be interested in learning more about what the library has to offer you to support your teaching. And over 70% at both institutions said yes. We were able to collect email addresses for people who voluntarily provided them that we then distributed to liaisons at both institutions so they could get in touch with those instructors and share some information. So uh, to put a positive spin on it, let's talk about the less good or the bad. Opportunities, I like to call this as well. So students, unsurprisingly, we already know this, are really struggling with how to cite sources. My own students who are master's students in an LIS program really struggle with citation. We just had what we call in the South a little come to Jesus in both of my classes last week talking about you know when you cite things that yes, you have to always provide a page number. If you use a direct quote, um, people still have a, a problem with that. But then our instructors who replied to the survey said that they themselves have trouble with proper citations. And as we are collecting and using different types of source material, not just text anymore, it's becoming more and more complex. And even people who are trained as researchers and writers need some remediation there too. Um, students remain wedded to Wikipedia, and I'm by no means a Wikipedia hater, but um, it was very interesting to hear the presentation about Wikipedia editing yesterday and think about, you know, that that's an opportunity for a little bit of instruction as well to let instructors know that, you know, Wikipedia isn't always terrible. Um, and again, people who said, you know, I never really thought about using the library to support my teaching, especially with distance ed students, but hopefully they would in the future. So moving on to talk about the instruction component of this, um, we decided to do kind of a quasi-longitudinal experimental study. Uh, most of the research in the efficacy of library instruction tends to be about a one-shot session. That's where academic librarians can get in and actually provide instruction. It's very difficult to get that kind of sustained relationship with a specific class. So we decided to try to do this to the extent that it was possible within the constraints of the university by doing a three-session workshop series with students from a particular class. We did pre- and post-session assessments of their skills, also their awareness of services and resources that were available to them. And we also looked at their emotional changes. If they felt more comfortable with using the library, if they were more likely to actually come to the library and ask a librarian for assistance after having this kind of extended introduction to library resources. These were designed and taught by Teresa, as well as Rachel Radham, who is an assistant professor and was at the time an instructional services librarian. She's now the scholarly communications librarian at University of Tennessee and Regina Mays, who is the assessment librarian at University of Tennessee. So we piloted this with a small group of students in the spring of 2012. Um, we were eventually able to do this over the summer with a group of students who were coming in for a program to kind of, these were at-risk students who were coming in to kind of transition them over the summer into academic life in a college environment. We also, interestingly, were able to um, conduct this series of workshops with, of course, some content adjustment with a group of um, peer students. That the acronym stands, stands for um, Excellence and Equity, Program for Excellence and Equity in Research. I always have trouble with those kind of tortured acronyms. 
Um, it's a funded NIH funded program. It's a PhD program. So we were able to do the same workshop with slight adjustments and content with both at risk incoming freshmen and doctoral students in a very elite nationally funded program. So we asked them about negative experiences that they'd had in libraries. What was the best experience you've ever had in a library? What was the worst? Most of the, the bridge students, these are the incoming at-risk students, felt that the staff was unhelpful. It was actually surprising and a little bit sad to see how many of those students um, identified staff experiences as their very worst experiences in libraries up to that point. Uh, they felt that they were almost always successful searching Google for information that they needed for assignments, but they recognized that they often needed materials from other sources. They said that they sometimes do have difficulty finding good information and often find that researching a topic takes more time than they expect it to. So we asked them after the conclusion of the workshops, what did you feel was the best part of participating in these workshops? And we were really happy to see that they felt, especially, I mean, our main objective was to make them more comfortable with the library and the people that work there. And we were able to, to really demonstrate that that happened. So they said they were more likely after the sessions to ask a librarian for help with their research. They'll be able to find the information they need in less time, and so on. So we were able, actually, because we did this um, through an established program, to follow up with these students six months later. And we found some sustained positive results that they had actually come to use the library and they felt comfortable using the library in their work. With the peer students, this is the PhD group, um, their negative experiences focused more on facilities and resources, not having the resources that they needed and not having quiet spaces to study. Most of them always begin a project by reviewing the literature. That's not surprising. These are experienced graduate students. But again, 85% of them felt, felt that they were almost always or very often successful searching Google for information. So the best thing about the workshops for them, interestingly, this really surprised me. We did a session. One of the sessions focused in large part on plagiarism and avoiding plagiarism. And the PhD students identified that overwhelmingly as one of the best parts of the workshop. And Teresa Hi, everyone. I'm Teresa Walker. I'm Associate Dean for Learning, Research, and Engagement at the University of Tennessee. This is my allergy season, so I apologize ahead of time. Um, I'm going to talk about the common study that's part of the lab value study you've just heard about. And what we did there was we looked at student reported usage of the commons some of the more effective data, and then we paired that with demographic information at the university, but also progress toward degree data, and I'll talk a little bit more, more about that later. But um, we did this study not just to be part of this project, but because we were noticing something. We live with the students every day. We, um, we either work at desks where we interact with them or we teach classes and we see what they're doing in the spaces. And so we were noticing some patterns and we wanted, some, we wanted to make some evidence-based decisions about that. So to tell you a little bit about our commons, in 2005, we sort of conceived of the commons as something that we wanted to do, a partnership with the Office of Information Technology, and mainly to create a student-centered space. Um, we actually invited um, Joan Lippincott to come and speak with us, and she inspired our thinking, helped us organize our thinking around the topic. And um, we worked very closely with that Office of Information Technology and also our writing center to put this together. And we didn't have any money to do it. We just had the idea and we decided this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna move some services out of this large room. We're gonna be open 24 hours. We're gonna put these offices together. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we're gonna have a Starbucks. So <laughs> you get that. Um, it was overwhelmingly overwhelmingly accepted and embraced by the students. They were there, and they were there 24 hours, and we could see kind of what they were doing, and the university took note, too. The university saw what was happening and that they were there, and the next two renovations were fully funded. So just to show you kind of how much the students embraced this, this was our accidental grand opening. We didn't have the computers in there. They weren't set up. So there, there's so much that wasn't ready but they stormed the caution tape and just took it down, so we had an accidental grand opening. 
So one of the reasons we wanted to do this is we wanted to tell our story and we knew what we had. We had automatically collected data like gate counts and computer logins and things like that. We had a very good plan among our commons partners to collect statistics and share them with one another. And we knew we could get demographic data. We had the National Survey of Student Engagement. We really took a survey of what we had and what, what data we had, what we needed. And we knew we needed some student reported usage data. And we knew, more importantly, maybe that we needed some of that student reported value. The difficult piece was getting an augmented university data set. And this was a few years ago, so this was a little bit before I think there was such a move to um, showing these outcomes and having analytics at the university like we do now. And it's just been a few years, I think, that this has really been a trend. But um, we had the demographic and admissions data, but we did not have progress toward degree. Um, that was something we really had to work hard to get. We had two surveys, and we were running two surveys because we had made some assumptions at the beginning about who our audience was, and we really wanted to get in there and talk to them. And so when we looked out into the commons, we said, okay, we're gonna do an in-person survey to find out what people are doing when they come in, um, who they are, and then we're gonna do an in-class survey, and we're gonna use um, a communication studies general education course to find out what those students are doing. We wanted to do that first or second year general education course because we thought that's probably our target audience. So for the in-person survey, this is just an example question. Please identify your class standing. Um, that became important to us and I'll show you that a little bit later. For the in-class survey, we had questions like how often do you use the commons? And you indicated that you use the comments for studying in groups. How long do you do that typically? So those are kinds of things you would expect. But we also had other things like, to what extent does the library commons encourage creativity or help you do better in class, make you feel more involved? So the reason we did that is because we had to think in this study about what was student success at the University of Tennessee. And for us, overwhelmingly, it was retention. Retention was our biggest issue. Retention is still our biggest issue. We've made great strides in that area. We've been recognized as a university for doing that, but it still remains something we have to constantly look after. And students were not leaving because they had financial problems or because they weren't doing well in class. They were leaving because they didn't find their place there or feel like they belonged. Having said that, we were observing students and we knew we had a community. We knew that what we were doing with the commons was something that was working for our students and they were finding a place there. So we were delighted when the survey results came back to find that you know, over 74% of the students said that being in the commons, working in that environment actually made them feel more involved in the university. This was the best thing we could have found out. Um, many of them said it helped them do better in class. Um, over 80% said it was a great place to meet people. So we, we were like, good, that's what we hoped for. We didn't know what we would find, but that was definitely what we hoped for. Um, this is every librarian's favorite slide, I think. We found that the students who reported making the most use of the commons, and specifically research assistance and computer support, were making GPAs of 3.5 and above. And I will say we tracked these students. We tracked their reported usage with their progress toward degree data so we could see if these students were being retained semester after semester. We could see if they were progressing and having, you know, maintaining that GPA. And overwhelmingly, this was true. The opposite, unfortunately, was also true. Students who weren't doing this were not doing well, were not being retained. So here's more good that we found. 85% um, said it provides help with assignments. You can see 90% provides resources they need for class. And then we started looking at the data to think about other things, to improve our spaces. And so we were trying to find out how are they actually using it? Are they coming in just to check their email and that kind of thing? But it turned out most of them were coming in for individual or group study. They were coming in to work on assignments. You may notice that all these charts kind of look alike, and it's because Unsurprisingly, to most of you, students wanted more of everything. They wanted, in the same space that we had, to have more group study, more individual study, more completely quiet study, more places to practice presentations. So, this is what we did. We could not build onto our building, so we just started building in. We put um, study rooms all around the perimeter. We couldn't actually put them all the way to the ceiling, 
because of HVAC issues, and we had a limited budget to do it, but we did manage to put these study rooms all around the perimeters. And students wanted more of everything, and these rooms gave that to them. Um, it was still open. I think one of the things that's really important to students is to be able to see other students, even if they're quiet and alone in their own space. And so we let the natural light come through the windows. We had glass fronts in all these rooms, and they use them for quiet study. They also use them for group study. Um, this is one of my favorite slides. It looks boring. It is not. We started out the study. <laughs> one of the benefits of two studies, having the in-person and the in-class, was that we thought our population was mainly first-year students, because they look so young. <laughs> and so that's, you know, we concentrated on them for a certain part of the survey, but we found out that really we had a pretty equal distribution between freshmen all the way to graduate students with more seniors than anybody else. So we were so surprised by that. So we changed things. Instead of having all the student activities, um, engagement activities that focused on the freshmen, we started focusing on other groups as well. And one of the things we do now is focus on undergraduate research, which is really getting into that upper division kind of coursework. And so this is an example here of an undergraduate research project. So what happened next? We, you know, we've had this data a few years, but changes kept occurring. So one thing is the University of Tennessee really relies on an outcomes-based budget now. I think that's something we're seeing more and more of. Um, our funding comes from graduating students. It's not just retention anymore. It's about years to graduation. Also, um, we had a top 25 mandate. Our university created a new strategic initiative to be a top 25 university, which we were stressing was very ambitious and it's really about the journey. But at the, at the same time, this was something we were really putting a lot into and a lot of that focus was on undergraduate students. We also have the Tennessee Promise. For those of you who are not familiar, the Tennessee Promise says that all seniors, all Tennesseans, can have two free years of community or technical um, college when they graduate. And that meant we were going to get a whole new crop of students coming in. And one of the things we're seeing now, and that this data is still helping us with, is that our transfer students who have either two-year degrees or two years of college are coming in and doing very poorly in comparison with the first year students who are coming straight out of high school. So there's some new challenges and we're going back to this data and learning more. Um, just to talk a little about those top 25 strategic priorities, these are, these are the priorities and they're undergraduate education. They're about our faculty and staff and our infrastructure. And we've been very careful to align our strategic priorities with those. And we're in a good position to do that because of this study and because of the amount of time we spend with the students. So this is some of what this study did for us. Um, it allowed us to tell a story at the university level and to be part of the conversation. We didn't just say, OK, the university has decided this is what we're going to do. We helped them figure that out. We were at the table. We helped to develop the strategic plan. Our dean right now is actually um, leading the campus effort to uh, re-envision the strategic plan. And so um, we really do have a seat at the table that we probably would not have been able to have if we hadn't invested this kind of effort in figuring out what was happening and how we were contributing. Um, something else it did for us? Our chancellor was handing out dollars for new positions um, that supported student success. This was across all colleges. You had to compete for these positions, and the library got two of those. That's just unheard of. We have two student success librarians now. One focuses on transfer and upper division students. One focuses on first year students. And our director of first year studies at the university said very recently, I had to include it, everyone on campus is talking about it, but the library is actually doing something. Love it. Um, we also went through kind of a rebranding because of it. We're like, OK, we're the campus community. We're conveniently located between the dorms and the classrooms, we're Main Street. They walk through no matter what, they're here. So we really started capitalizing on that and having, just going ahead and branding it and having activities that called it that. We looked at the Commons as community. That's kind of what got us here anyway, is noticing that students were really spending their time here. We looked at the Commons as technology hub. We realized that that's where students are coming to use 
certain kinds of software, certain kinds of hardware, do certain kinds of things they can't do with their own equipment, that they can't afford to do with their own equipment. And so we've used this data to tell us, wait, we can't get rid of the, the really big computers in there. We wanted to get rid of desktop computers because everyone has a laptop, but we thought we can't do that. They're using the large monitors in the software. And then the Commons is academic support. Our latest renovation, the data really showed us that students were asking for certain things, and one of those things was the Math Tutorial Center. You know, we've always had the Writing Center there, but the students were like, we want the Math Tutorial Center, we want to be able to do everything in the world that we could possibly want to do in this building, and we want to do it for 24 hours. And so <laughs> that we, we did that, we've expanded our partnerships to include our Student Success Center. There's a space in there just for that, and we have an area of the Commons dedicated to tutoring. We have been very intentional with our partners in the Commons. They are not people who are coming in and using our space. There are partners in assessment, there are partners in thinking about how we deliver services, and there are allies. We get together and we talk about how we can best support students at our university. So, as I mentioned before, we have problems and opportunities the more we spend time with this data. Um, we're looking, we're, we have an initiative that students will take 15 hours to graduate in four years. We're looking at our sophomores now. We've improved retention rates, but are we losing them once they get to a certain area? Um, and what about transfer students? So living with the students every day, uh, we've talked a lot about the ethnographic studies. It's kind of an accidental ethnographic study. Here's some of your funny parts of this presentation now. So the difficulty is remaining open to what you see. One of the things, and I don't know if this happens in your space, is when students walk into a very large library, the first thing they do, I'll just demonstrate. They come in and they stare at their phone and they hide and they sit down and they don't know what to do next. And we've already made them uncomfortable as soon as they come through the door. The first thing we did, kind of realizing the anxiety that they were feeling coming into such a large space, was we made a landing space. And any architect or designer can tell you to do that, but for some reason, it took us years to do it. Now they come in, they plop down, they look very cool, they still check their phones, but they've got it, and they feel good immediately. Um, another favorite photo, ingenuity or scandal. Journalism students stacked tables on top of each other, skinny little tables, and they sat up in front of a screen so that they could film themselves looking like reporters. Well, that makes sense. Um, I thought it was great. I took a picture. I sent it out to our commons managers listserv, and everybody panicked. They're like, liability. You know, they're going to fall. The table's going to kill them. Oh, it was just terrible. It was terrible. But we paid attention. Um, we have teleprompters, we have green screens, we have a studio that has the green screens and that sort of thing. So we've, we've looked at our data and we've seen what the students are doing. Um, we wanted to give them more, the students more opportunities to interact with the spaces as well. And so we have lots of art hanging installments all around the area now throughout the library for student art, for student engagement and research activities and that sort of thing. In any space that's free, we try to make sure that students can use that the way they feel they want to use it. We have worked a lot on creating community. We've always had de-stress efforts you know, at the end during finals, but we have started um, branding those as well. And we've reached out to the entire campus to focus on wellness and to get more resources together uh, to come in and just help the students. You know, a lot of people do this, whether it's habit dogs or the little chair massages and things like that. But we do everything we can to make them feel good and safe in the space. And I'll have to say, one of the things we've kind of assessed along these lines um, the best we could was, you know, during finals, we would have trouble sometimes. Students would be ill. They would have seizures. These are terrible times for students. There was sometimes vandalism. We've really redoubled these efforts, and, and one of our partnerships has been with the UT police, and they actually have a little outpost in our library now where they can counsel students, they can react to certain things, just to provide kind of a measure of safety and security there. And um, we've really not seen the same kinds of problems since we've been looking after them in this way. Also extending community. One of the things the data told us about communities made us think we should go on out to the dorms. We've got something good going here. Let's go ahead and just push out. So for those of you who have been in college, which I assume is everyone, you probably, if you lived in a dorm, had to attend some event by your um, resident assistant. And they were always spectacular events like poetry night. They're required to do these things right. Or how to cook black beans and rice. I think I went to one of those. 
We said, okay, these are terrible. Let's reach out and say, we'll do this for them. So we created a program that should have been obvious years ago to go out and say, we're gonna do this for you. We're gonna talk about libraries. We're gonna teach you how to make a movie. This is the one where we actually had the dorms competing to make a movie in four hours. They learned about our studio resources. They checked out our equipment. They learned how to edit, sought their sources. And we just kind of took them through the whole process and had a contest. So I'm, I need you all to know that I'm aware of the grammar here. This should have been least expected, but it wasn't expected at all. So I'm gonna say it's most unexpected. The thing that after sitting with the data for so long, we had this epiphany in one of our instruction meetings and it was that the students who were making these 3.5 GPAs over time, who were using our resources so much, they weren't doing that because we we're so awesome. You know, we kind of thought that. We thought our service is so great. We are helping these students succeed. And then I was like, no, they're practicing. They are, they are learning the tools of scholarship and they're in the environment and they're using these over and over and becoming more and more comfortable being scholars in this environment. We completely changed the way we teach first and second year students, in some cases upper division students. And instead of bringing them in and saying, this is how you use the catalog, this is how you use the databases, this is how you cite your sources, we march them around the library and we take them in to ask us now and we say, okay, this is what you do. Hi, I'm an English 101 student. I'm writing a paper. I need to have three peer-reviewed resources. And we ask the question. We have them ask the question. We go to OIT. We do the same thing. And we really just move them around the space, practice using those things. And then we get together in the classroom and let them talk about what they did, what they learned, and just kind of teach each other a little bit as well. OK. We're going to share the next few minutes. So one of the things that Marilee asked us to talk about is um, potential pitfalls in developing and conducting studies like these, because it's never seamless, and there are some ugly aspects. So we've talked about the good, the less good, or the bad. Now we're going to talk about a little bit of ugliness. Um, so things that we wish we'd known and, and done differently. With the instructor survey, we pre-tested it, we piloted it, um, with a smaller group of people, and there were still things once the survey was launched that we wished we'd done differently. If you're going to do a large-scale survey like that, make sure that you are, try to be as exhaustive as you can with pre-testing and piloting. Um, when you're surveying faculty who create and conduct surveys themselves, they're probably gonna have something to say about your survey instrument. <laughs> we did get a couple of comments. Why is this ordinal? It should be. Um, just be prepared for that and try not to get your feelings hurt. Um, distribution was actually very challenging for us at UT. We did not have access to our Office of Information Technology, of course, has the capability of sending an email to everyone with a net ID um, who has responsibilities for teaching. But they don't just do that for anybody. You have to have an, an email request from the provost. And we weren't really willing for this project to expend the political capital it would take to get that. So we kind of cobbled together a mechanism for sending requests to our deans and directors list serves and having liaisons contact their uh, faculty and their departments. Because we asked people which departments they came from, we were able to identify after a few days which departments were maybe not getting those emails and redouble our efforts there. You need to have a distribution strategy up front, and that sounds obvious, but um, I wish that we had thought a little bit more about it. We had to kind of make it up as we went along. Securing support from different institutions on campus, different organizations and groups, we would not have been able to, to distribute the survey to the extent that we did at UT without buy-in from the library liaisons, without some support from the dean of libraries sent out the initial request to the deans and directors list. Um, I, as a second year assistant professor, would not have been able to get the response that we did without that support. University of North Carolina Wilmington, on the other hand, they were able to, to actually distribute their survey to everybody with instructional responsibilities. So it may be very different at your institution. For the instruction series, which was again a three workshop series conducted over three or four weeks in the summer, um, we should have anticipated that some students would skip class, but we kind of didn't. And that made it difficult when we were trying to track which students, the student improvement over that that course of time, could we really say that student A 
had improved their awareness of library resources or proper citation techniques when they skipped the second workshop. So we had to kind of, again, adjust our um, data analysis on the fly after that, and that's something to, to plan on. I mean, we all know that students skip class. Um, anonymity, of course, is a challenge when you're dealing with students because of FERPA regulations. Um, we had to, we ended up giving, giving our students, I think, code words. We just came up with a, a random list of like chocolate. So um, chocolate would put in his identifying name, chocolate, uh, so that we could track who had been at each session. So come, coming up with some kind of system for maintaining your students' anonymity, but also being able to attach pre and post test results to a specific student is really key. Um, it was very helpful that this was done through a program that required students to attend this particular class. Um, that's kind of the stick. We didn't really have any carrots to offer. We were on a very mm -hmm. limited budget in terms of incentives, but you do need to think about that. Are you gonna incentivize participation or are you going to get them to come with the threat of punishment? So speaking of um, incentivizing and, and then threatening, um, for the in-person survey, it was easy. We had a thousand respondents almost. I mean, it was fantastic. And all we had to do was put up a little poster that said you can win $50. And so anybody came in and said, yeah, yeah, we want to do that. Um, not so for the in-class survey. We really benefited from the partnership with the School of Information Sciences because communications um, studies 210 and 240, which is the class we gave the survey to, um, are part of that larger college. And we were able, the students in that program um, have to take surveys as part of their grade. And so we submitted this as one of those surveys and we were lucky that 150 of them wanted to take it. And so that's how we got that information. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the data management challenges. As Rachel said, pre-testing pre can eliminate some unnecessary troubles that you may have. More pre-testing for us, you know, on a larger scale, could have shown us where we had some unnecessary conditional logic that makes it very difficult to compile the data and look at it in many meaningful ways. And so that's something I would do differently now. Um, there's a lot more data than you think. You'll have to enter some of it manually. <laughs> um, we just had so many disparate kinds of data. When you're looking at survey data from two sources, when you're looking for, for progress toward degree and demographic data and those things, you're pulling a lot of stuff together. Um, and then you'll have to manage the confidentiality. Even though the university's um, Office of Informational Research and Assessment said they were going to help us out along those lines, we really had to be careful and manage that ourselves. So we're good. Oh, okay, that's me. So a little bit about sustainability. So our questions are still relevant. Um, even slight tweaks now, I think, would yield very interesting, valuable results for us. And even just sitting with this existing data has shown us um, new things that we can do. I wanted to talk a little bit about our next steps. Based on what we've learned, we are getting ready to create a university showcase and project lab. Um, we've had so much support from the university and really we've been very successful at telling our story of what we do that um, the next step will be to have kind of a welcome area where students and parents will be able to come in, learn more about what it means to be part of the university, what it means to be part of our library, and also have a very visible project lab where interdisciplinary groups can come together, like an incubator lab and that sort of thing. Um, the other exciting news I have from all of this is that our going out, reaching out to the residence halls has really um, benefited us in that now the library will be not just supporting, but sponsoring a living and learning community. It's called Discovery, and we're working with our Office of Undergraduate Research to um, actually you know, teach a course and um, have a living and learning community. We're going to start out with just 50 students in the second year of the um, the second year, the students who were in there originally will actually be peer mentors for the original group or for the next group. And so we're very excited about the possibilities there. So I just, the, the theme of, of this presentation, this panel is um, research and practice, collaboration of research and practice. 
And I just wanted to encourage all of you as practicing librarians, as most of you are, some of you are LIS faculty too, to think about ways that you can get involved with either librarians in your area or LIS faculty in your area. We collaborate a lot between the libraries and, and CIS more and more all the time, really, in all kinds of ways. But specifically, let's talk about research a little bit and the importance of research for, for teaching and practice. Um, I really liked what Mega had to say about the ways in which research can inform practice and, and vice versa. I was an academic librarian before I went over to the dark side and became an LIS faculty member. So my experience as a practitioner informs everything that I do as a researcher. Um, really, it, it's my goal in all the research that I do to have some impact potentially on practice. I don't mean to sound grandiose, but, but that's really what I'm trying to do. And I would just encourage all of you, um, if you have an LIS program in your area, if you are a librarian and you want to collaborate on a project, reach out to people in that, in that program, faculty members or even some graduate students in that program to see if you can collaborate on something. When I was an academic librarian, I had faculty status and research responsibilities, and I just, I didn't have time to do the research, which I'm sure is the experience that most of you have as well. Now, as a faculty member, I have a lot more time that I allocate toward research, so let us help you out with some of those things. Um, you know, the saying that a rising tide lift, lifts all boats. In terms of LIS education and practice, I think that's really true in research collaboration. Do you have anything else you want to say? Okay. Thank you.